Breathe in, breathe out, feel the air filling your lungs, then gently leaving your body. In this moment, right here and now, you're exactly where you need to be. Your presence in this room, your willingness to listen and learn to grow and change. That's the first step on an incredible path of self-discovery and inner. Today, we're gonna to talk about something that affects millions of people around the world, anxiety. But we're not just gonna talk about it, we're gonna transform our relationship with it. We're gonna learn how to manage it, how to let it go. And most importantly, how to understand that your anxiety won't change anything. Now, I want you to think about the last time you felt anxious. Maybe it was this morning as you were getting ready for work. Maybe it was last night as you lay in bed, your mind racing with thoughts about the future. Or maybe it's right now as you sit here wondering what this talk will be about and if it will really help you. Whatever that moment was, I want you to hold on to it for a second. Feel those sensations in your body, the tightness in your chest, the knot in your stomach the racing of your heart. Now ask yourself, this, did that anxiety change anything in your external world? Uh, did it solve any problems? Did it make your life better in any way? The answer, my friends, is no. Your anxiety didn't change anything. It never does. Anxiety is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. While anxiety doesn't change your external circumstances, you have the power to change your relationship with anxiety. You have the ability to manage it, to understand it, and ultimately to let it go. This isn't about eliminating anxiety from your life entirely. That's not realistic and it's not even desirable. A little bit of anxiety is normal. It's your body's way of alerting you to potential dangers or important tasks. The problem arises when anxiety takes over, when it becomes the driving force in your life rather than the uh, occasional passenger. So how do we begin this process of managing our anxiety and learning to let it go? It starts with understanding. Understanding that your thoughts are not facts. Understanding that you are not your anxiety. Understanding that you have the power to choose your response to anxious feelings. Think about it this way. Anxiety is like a loud, persistent neighbor who keeps knocking on your door. You can't control when this neighbor decides to knock, but you can control how you respond. You can choose to open the door and let them in, allowing them to take over your house. Or you can acknowledge their presence, politely decline their invitation to come in and go about your day. This is the essence of managing anxiety. It's not about getting rid of that neighbor entirely. That's not possible. It's about changing how you interact with them. It's about recognizing their presence without letting them dictate your actions. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, Wayne, that sounds great in theory, but how do I actually do that? How do I change years, maybe even decades of anxious thinking? The answer is simple, but it's not easy. It requires practice, patience, and most importantly, self-compassion. You're not going to master this overnight, and that's okay. The goal isn't perfection. It's progress. Let's start with a simple exercise. The next time you feel anxiety creeping in, I want you to pause, take a deep breath, and then I want you to name your anxiety. Give it a character, a personality. Maybe it's a worried old man named Harold or a frantic squirrel named Nutsy. Whatever image comes to mind, go with it. Now, when you feel anxious thoughts arising, you can say, oh, there's Harold again worrying about the future. Or look at Nutsy running around in circles over something that hasn't even happened yet. This simple act of naming your anxiety creates a bit of distance between you and your anxious thoughts. It helps you see that you are not your anxiety. You are the observer of your anxiety. And as the observer, you have power. You have choice. But naming your anxiety is just the beginning. The next step is to question it. When anxious thoughts arise, ask yourself, is this thought helpful? Is it based on facts or assumptions? What would I say to a friend who had this thought? Often, you'll find that your anxious thoughts are based on assumptions, on worst case scenarios that are unlikely to happen. By questioning these thoughts, you start to loosen their hold on you. You start to see them for what they are, just thoughts. Now, I wanna be clear about something. This process of managing anxiety isn't about positive thinking. It's not about 
telling yourself, don't worry, be happy, that kind of forced positivity often backfires, making us feel worse because now we're anxious and we feel like we're failing at not being anxious. Instead, this is about realistic thinking. It's about looking at your anxious thoughts objectively without judgment. It's about recognizing when your mind is catastrophizing and gently guiding it back to the present moment. Speaking of the present moment, that's where the real magic happens in managing anxiety. Anxiety is almost always about the future, worrying about what might happen, what could go wrong, but the future doesn't exist. It's a concept, a story we tell ourselves. The only thing that's real, the only thing we can truly know and experience is this present moment. So how do we stay in the present moment when our minds want to race ahead to an imaginary future? One powerful tool is mindfulness. Mindfulness is simply the act of paying attention to the present moment without judgment. It's about noticing what's happening right now, both in your external environment and in your internal world of thoughts and feelings. You can practice mindfulness anywhere at any time. Right now, for example, try this. Notice the feeling of your feet on the floor. Notice the temperature of the air on your skin. Notice the rhythm of your breath. Notice any sounds you can hear. Notice any thoughts passing through your mind. This simple act of noticing brings you back to the present moment. And in the present moment, anxiety has no power because in this moment, right here and now, you're okay, you're breathing, you're alive. You're doing just fine. Of course, your mind will wander. That's what minds do. The key is to notice when it wanders and gently bring it back to the present. Each time you do this, you're strengthening your ability to manage your anxiety. You're teaching your brain a new habit. Now, let's talk about another powerful tool for managing anxiety. Gratitude. Anxiety and gratitude cannot coexist in the same moment. When you're truly feeling grateful, it's impossible to feel anxious at the same time. So how do we cultivate gratitude? It's not about forcing yourself to feel grateful when you don't. It's about training your mind to notice the good things in your life, no matter how small they might seem. Try this. Every night before you go to bed, think of three things you're grateful for. They don't have to be big things. Maybe you're grateful for the comfortable bed you're about to sleep in. Maybe you're grateful for the delicious meal you had for dinner. Maybe you're grateful for the kind smile a stranger gave you on the street. By doing this simple practice consistently, you're training your brain to look for the positive in your life. You're creating new neural pathways that make it easier to access feelings of gratitude and contentment. But managing anxiety isn't just about what happens in your mind. It's also about how you treat your body. Your physical health has a huge impact on your mental health. Regular exercise, a healthy diet, and adequate sleep are all crucial for managing anxiety. Exercise in particular is a powerful anxiety buster. When you exercise, your body releases endorphins, which are natural mood boosters. Exercise also helps burn off excess energy that might otherwise fuel your anxiety. Plus, the act of focusing on your physical movements can be a form of mindfulness, bringing you back to the present moment. You don't need to become a gym rat or run marathons to get the anxiety-busting benefits of exercise. A brisk 30-minute walk every day can make a huge difference. The key is to find a form of movement that you enjoy and can stick with consistently. Now, let's talk about sleep. If you're not getting enough quality sleep, you're going to have a much harder time managing your anxiety. When we're tired, our ability to cope with stress decreases and our tendency to worry increases. If you're having trouble sleeping, try establishing a consistent bedtime routine. Turn off screens at least an hour before bed. Create a relaxing environment in your bedroom. Practice some gentle stretching or deep breathing exercises before sleep. And if anxious thoughts are keeping you awake, try writing them down in a journal. Sometimes the act of getting them out of your head and onto paper can help quiet your mind. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, Wayne, this all sounds great, but what about when I'm in the middle of an anxiety attack? How do I manage that? First, remember that an anxiety attack, no matter how intense it feels, cannot hurt you. It's uncomfortable. Yes, but it's not dangerous. Your body is having a false alarm, thinking there's danger when there isn't. When you feel an anxiety attack coming on, the first thing to do is breathe. Take slow, deep breaths, 
inhale for a count of four, hold for a count of four, exhale for a count of four, and hold for a count of four. Repeat this until you start to feel calmer. Next, ground yourself in the present moment. Use your senses. Name five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. This exercise brings you back to the present moment and out of the anxious thoughts in your head. Remember, an anxiety attack is like a wave. It will build, it will peak, and then it will pass. Your job is to ride the wave, not to fight it. Fighting against anxiety often makes it worse. Acceptance, as counterintuitive as it might seem, is often the quickest way through. Now let's talk about something that many people with anxiety struggle with, or perfectionism. Perfectionism and anxiety often go hand in hand. The desire to do everything perfectly, to never make a mistake, can be a huge source of anxiety. Perfection is an illusion, it doesn't exist. And the pursuit of perfection is often a way of avoiding the vulnerability that comes with being human. When we try to be perfect, we're really saying, if I do everything right, I can avoid pain, avoid criticism, avoid failure. But pain, criticism, and failure are all part of the human experience. They're how we learn and grow. By trying to avoid these experiences, we're actually stunting our own growth and creating more anxiety for ourselves. Instead of striving for perfection, strive for excellence. Excellence allows for mistakes. It allows for learning. It allows for growth. Excellence is about doing your best, not about being the best. Remember, you are a human being, not a human doing. Your worth is not determined by your productivity or your achievements. You are inherently worthy, just as you are right now in this moment. This brings us to another important aspect of managing anxiety. See, self-compassion. Many of us are incredibly hard on ourselves when we feel anxious. We berate ourselves for being weak or stupid for feeling this way. But would you talk to a friend that way? If they were feeling anxious? Of course not. So why do we talk to ourselves that way? Self-compassion is about treating yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you would offer to a good friend. It's about recognizing that anxiety is a common human experience, not a personal failing. It's about comforting yourself when you're struggling rather than criticizing yourself. The next time you're feeling anxious, try putting a hand on your heart and saying to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. This simple act of self-compassion can be incredibly powerful in reducing anxiety. Now let's talk about something that many people with anxiety struggle with. Like anxiety should make it. When we're anxious, even small decisions can feel overwhelming. We worry about making the wrong choice, about all the potential negative outcomes. But here's the theory, there are very few decisions in life that are truly irreversible. Most of the time, if we make a decision and it doesn't work out, we can course correct. We can learn from it and make a different choice next time. When you're faced with a decision and feeling anxious about it, try this. First, get clear on your values. What's truly important to you? Then look at your options and ask yourself which of these aligns best with my values. Make your decision based on that. And remember, not making a decision is itself a decision. Often, the anxiety of indecision is worse than the potential consequences of making the wrong choice. Another powerful tool for managing anxiety is to challenge your need for certainty. Anxiety often stems from a desire to know exactly what's going to happen, to be certain about the future. But the truth is, certainty is an illusion. The future is always unknown. Instead of seeking certainty, try cultivating comfort with uncertainty. Remind yourself that you've faced unknown situations before and you've survived, you've grown, you've learned. Uncertainty isn't just a source of anxiety, it's also a source of possibility. Without uncertainty, there would be no surprises, no growth, no adventure. Now let's talk about the role of connection in managing anxiety. Humans are social creatures. We're wired for connection, and yet, Anxiety often makes us want to isolate ourselves. We worry about being a burden to others or we fear judgment. But connection is one of the most powerful antidotes to anxiety. When we share our struggles with others, we realize we're not alone. We gain new perspectives. We feel supported and understood. This doesn't mean you need to broadcast your anxiety to the world. It means having a few trusted people in your life who you can turn to when you're struggling. 
It means being willing to be vulnerable, to ask for help when you need it. And connection isn't just about receiving support. It's also about giving it. When we help others, when we listen to their struggles and offer compassion, we often find that our own anxiety lessens. It takes us out of our own heads and reminds us of our shared humanity. Now, I want to address something that many people with anxiety struggle with, the fear of failure. This fear can be paralyzing, preventing us from taking risks, from pursuing our dreams, from living fully. But here's the truth. is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. Every successful person you admire has failed many, many times. The difference is they didn't let those failures stop them. They learned from them, they grew from them, and they kept going. When you're afraid of failure, ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? And if that worst case scenario came true, how would I handle it? Often, you'll find that even the worst case scenario is manageable. And by thinking through how you'd handle it, you're reminding yourself of your own resilience and resourcefulness. Remember, the only true failure is not trying. Everything else is just learning. Now let's talk about the power of your words. The language we use both in our internal dialogue and in our conversations with others has a huge impact on our anxiety levels. Words like always, never, should, and must often fuel anxiety. They create rigid, all or nothing thinking that doesn't reflect the nuanced reality of life. Like start paying attention to your language. When you catch yourself using these anxiety fueling words, pause. Reframe your thought or statement in a more flexible, realistic way. Instead of, I always mess things up, try sometimes I make mistakes and that's okay, I'm learning and growing. This simple shift in language can have a profound effect on your anxiety levels over time. It's not about forced positivity, it's about accuracy. It's about describing your experiences and expectations in a way that's true to the complexities of life. Another powerful tool for managing anxiety is to focus on what you can control. So much of our anxiety comes from trying to control things that are simply out of our hands. We worry about other people's opinions, about future events, about things that might never happen. But the only thing we truly have control over is ourselves. Our thoughts, our actions, our responses to what life throws our way. When you find yourself worrying about something, ask yourself, is this something I have control over? If the answer is no, practice accepting it. If the answer is yes, focus on what actions you can take. This shift in focus from the uncontrollable to the controllable is incredibly empowering. It moves you from a place of helplessness to a place of agency. It reminds you that while you can't control everything that happens to you, you always have. Now, I want to talk about something that's often overlooked when it comes to managing anxiety, the importance of play and fun. As adults, we often forget the value of play. We get so caught up in our responsibilities, in our worries about the future, that we forget to enjoy the present moment. But play isn't just for children. It's a vital part of a healthy, balanced life for people of all ages. When we play, when we have fun, we're fully present in the moment. We're not worrying about the future or ruminating on the past. We're just being, just enjoying. So I challenge you to bring more play into your life. What activities bring you joy? What makes you laugh? What helps you feel free and unselfconscious? Maybe it's dancing in your living room or playing a sport or doing a puzzle or singing at the top of your lungs in your car. Whatever it is, make time for it. Prioritize it. Your anxiety will thank you. Now let's talk about the power routine in managing anxiety. When we're anxious, we often feel out of control. Establishing a routine can help us regain a sense of control and predictability in our lives. It provides structure to our days and can significantly reduce decision fatigue, which is a common source of anxiety. Your routine doesn't have to be rigid or all-encompassing. Start small. Maybe it's a morning routine where you meditate for five minutes, write in a gratitude journal and eat a healthy breakfast or an evening routine where you turn off screens an hour before bed, read a book, and practice some gentle stretching. The key is consistency. By doing these things regularly, you're sending a powerful message to your subconscious mice. I'm in control. I can handle it. But while routine is important, so is flexibility. Life is unpredictable. And if we're too rigid in our routines, any disruption can trigger anxiety. 
So while you're establishing routines, also practice adapting when things don't go as planned. This balance of structure and flexibility is key to managing anxiety in the long term. Now I want to address something that many people with anxiety struggle with. The tendency to ruminate, to replay past events or worry about future ones over and over in our minds. This mental habit can be exhausting and can significantly increase our anxiety levels. When you notice yourself ruminating, it can be helpful to redirect your attention to the present moment. One effective way to do this is through the practice of mindful observation. Choose an object in your environment. It could be a plant, a piece of art, or even your own hand. Really look at it as if you're seeing it for the first time. Notice its colors, its textures, its shapes. This simple act of focused attention can break the cycle of rumination and bring you back to the present moment. Another powerful tool for managing rumination is to schedule worry time. This might sound counterintuitive, but hear me out. Set aside a specific time each day, say 15 minutes in the evening. When anxious thoughts come up during the day, jot them down and tell yourself you'll think about them during your designated worry time. This helps contain your worries and prevents them from taking over your entire day. When your worry time comes, sit down with your list of concerns for each one. Ask yourself, is this something I can take action on? If yes, make a plan to address it. If no, practice accepting that it's out of your control. Often, you'll find that many of the things you were worrying about earlier in the day no longer seem as urgent or important. Now let's talk about the role of purpose in managing anxiety. When we have a strong sense of purpose, a clear understanding of what we value and what we want to contribute to the world, it can significantly reduce our anxiety. Purpose gives us direction. It helps us prioritize. It gives meaning to our struggles. Finding your purpose doesn't necessarily mean you need to change the world or do something grandiose. Your purpose might be to be a loving parent, to create beautiful art, to help people in your community, or to pursue knowledge in a field you're passionate about. The key is that it resonates deeply with you and aligns with your values. If you're not sure what your purpose is, start by asking yourself, what activities make me lose track of time? What issues or causes am I passionate about? What kind of impact do I want to have on the world? Reflect on these questions regularly. Journal about them. Talk about them with people you trust. Over time, your sense of purpose will become clearer. And remember, your purpose can evolve over time. What gives your life meaning at 25 might be different from what gives it meaning at 45 or 65. Be open to this evolution. It's not about finding one fixed purpose for your entire life. It's about continually aligning your actions with what feels meaningful and important to you. Now, I want to address a common misconception about managing anxiety. The idea that if we're doing it right, we'll never feel anxious again. This simply isn't true, and holding on to this belief can actually increase our anxiety. Because when we do inevitably feel anxious, we then feel like we failed. The goal isn't to never feel anxious. The goal is to change our relationship with anxiety, to see it not as an enemy to be defeated, but as a part of our human experience to be understood and managed to recognize that we can feel anxious and still Think of it this way. Anxiety is like weather. We can't control when a storm will come, but we can learn to navigate through it. We can build a sturdy shelter. We can learn to dance in the rain. We can appreciate the growth that comes after the storm has passed. This shift in perspective, it, from trying to eliminate anxiety to learning to coexist with it, is incredibly liberating. It takes away the pressure to be anxiety-free and instead focuses on building resilience, on growing our capacity to handle whatever life throws our way. Now let's talk about the power of reframing. Our anxiety is often fueled by the stories we tell ourselves about our experiences, but we have the power to change these stories. We have the power to reframe our experiences in a way that reduces anxiety and increases our sense of capability. For example, let's say you're about to give a presentation at work and you're feeling anxious. The typical anxious story might be, I'm so nervous. What if I mess up? Everyone will think I'm incompetent. But what if we reframe this? What if instead we told ourselves, 
I'm feeling excited about sharing my ideas. This nervous energy means I care about doing a good job. Even if I make a mistake, it's an opportunity to learn and improve. See how this reframe changes the entire emotional tone of the experience. It doesn't deny the feelings of nervousness, but it interprets them in a way that's empowering rather than debilitating. Practice looking for alternative interpretations of situations that make you anxious. Ask yourself, is there another way to look at this? What might a confident person think in this situation? What advice would I give a friend in this situation? Over time, this practice of reframing can significantly reduce your anxiety and increase. Now, I want to address something that many people with anxiety struggle. The tendency to avoid situations that make us anxious. This avoidance might bring short-term relief, but in the long run, it actually reinforces our anxiety. It sends a message to our brain that says, yes, this situation is indeed dangerous. You were right to be afraid. Instead of avoiding, we need to practice gradual exposure. This doesn't mean throwing yourself into your worst fear all at once. It means taking small, manageable steps towards facing your fears. If you're anxious about social situations, maybe you start by saying hello to one new person each day. If you're anxious about public speaking, maybe you start by speaking up more in small group sets. The key is to stay in the anxiety-provoking situation long enough to realize that you can handle it and be the worst case scenario you were imagining probably didn't happen. Each time you do this, you're building evidence that counters your anxious beliefs. You're showing yourself that you're more capable than your anxiety wants you to believe. Remember, courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is feeling the fear and taking action anyway, and each time you act courageously, you grow stronger, you expand your comfort zone, you increase your resilience. Now let's talk about the importance of self-care and managing anxiety. When we're anxious, we often neglect our basic needs. We might skip meals, sacrifice sleep, or push ourselves too hard, but this only fuels our anxiety further. It's like trying to drive a car without putting gas in the tank. Self-care isn't selfish, it's not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's about treating yourself with the same care and consideration you would offer to someone you love. It's about recognizing that you can't pour from an empty cup. So what does self-care look like? It's different for everyone, but it generally involves taking care of your physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. It might include things like getting enough sleep, eating nutritious meals, exercising regularly, spending time in nature, practicing relaxation techniques, engaging in hobbies you enjoy, or spending time with people who uplift. The key is to make self-care a regular part of your routine, not just something you do when you're already feeling overwhelmed. Think of it as preventative maintenance for your mental health. And remember, self-care sometimes means saying no to things that drain you or setting boundaries with people who increase your anxiety. It's okay to prioritize your own well-being. In fact, it's necessary if you want to be able to show up fully in your life and for the people you care about. Now, I want to talk about the power of visualization and managing anxiety. Our minds are incredibly powerful, and we can use this power to our advantage. When we vividly imagine ourselves handling a situation calmly and confidently, we're actually we're creating neural pathways that make it easier for us to respond that way when we're actually in the situation. So try this. Think of a situation that typically makes you anxious. Now, close your eyes and imagine yourself in that situation, handling it with ease and grace. See yourself breathing calmly, speaking confidently, moving with purpose. Really feel those feelings of calm and confidence in your body. The more vividly you can imagine this, the more powerful the effect will be. Do this visualization regularly, especially before you're about to enter an anxiety-provoking situation. Over time, you'll find that your real-life responses start to mirror your visualizations. Now, let's address something that's crucial for long-term anxiety management. The importance of professional help. While all the strategies we've discussed can be incredibly helpful, sometimes we need additional support. And that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It's a sign of strength and self-awareness to recognize when we need help and to seek it out. If your anxiety is significantly impacting your daily life, if you're struggling to implement these strategies on your own, or if you're dealing with panic attacks or other intense symptoms, please consider talking to a mental health professional. They can provide personalized strategies, 
help you understand the root causes of your anxiety, and in some cases, discuss whether medication might be helpful. Remember, seeking help isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign that you're committed to your well-being, that you're taking active steps to improve your life. It's an act of self-love and courage. As we near the end of our time together, I want to remind you of something crucial. You are not your anxiety. Your anxiety is something you experience, but it doesn't define you. You are so much more than your anxious thoughts and feelings. You are a complex, multifaceted human being with strengths, talents, dreams, and an infinite capacity for growth and change. Your anxiety is not a personal failing. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a part of your human experience, just like joy, anger, love, and every other emotion. By learning to manage your anxiety, you're not trying to get rid of a part of yourself. You're learning to work with all parts of yourself in a way that allows you to live a full, rich, meaningful life. Remember, managing anxiety is a journey, not a destination. There will be ups and downs. There will be days when you feel on top of the world and days when your anxiety feels overwhelming. This is normal. This is part of the process. The key is to keep going to be patient with yourself, to celebrate your progress, no matter how small it might seem. Every time you use a coping strategy, every time you face a fear, every time you show yourself compassion, you're growing stronger, you're building resilience, you're expanding your capacity to handle whatever life throws your way. So I invite you, starting right now, to commit to your own growth and well-being. Commit to practicing these strategies regularly. Commit to treating yourself with kindness and understanding. Commit to facing your fears bit by bit. Commit to living fully, not in spite of your anxiety, but alongside it. You have everything you need within you to manage your anxiety. You have the power to create a life of peace, purpose, and joy. Trust in that power. Believe in yourself. Take it one day at a time, one breath at a time. Remember, your anxiety won't change anything, but you can change your relationship with anxiety. You can learn to manage it. You can learn to let it go. And in doing so, you open yourself up to a world of possibilities. Thank you for being here, for being willing to learn and grow. Remember, every moment is a new opportunity to choose how you want to respond to life. Choose wisely, choose with self-compassion, and know that you are capable of handling whatever comes your way. Now take a deep breath, feel your feet on the ground, feel the air in your lungs, you are here in this moment. And in this moment, you are okay. Carry that awareness with you as you go forward, you've got this. I believe in you, 